Senna, who actually started ADSCFT the 25 years ago, which is the event we are we are celebrating 25 years of holography. Uh, so let me say a few words about uh, Juan. So he um, did his undergraduate at the University of Buenos Aires, then was at Instituto Balsero in Bariloche for uh, um, a licenciatura, and at, he got his PhD at Princeton in '96. One year postdoc at Rusk, Rutgers, and afterwards he was already a professor at Harvard from 97 to 2001. Uh, and since 2001, he's um, a professor at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. Um, he won many prizes, too many to describe all of them, but let me just say a few, few more, the more, uh, more important ones. The Heinemann Prize for Mathematical Physics, the uh, Fundamental Physics Prize, um, the ICTP Dirac uh, Prize. Uh, he was also a Mac MacArthur Fellow and a Sloan Fellow. Got the Einstein Medal, Lawrence Medal, Galileo Galilei Medal, and many others I will not uh, say. Um, his um, uh, contributions are many in string theory, black hole physics, cosmology, and of course, ADS-CFT. In uh, November 97, he wrote the paper that started it, and it was published in 98, 25 years ago and already has more than 18,000 citations. Um, and in total, one has more than 76,000 citations. Um, and finally, there's a connection with our own ICTP Safer, uh, him being member of the steering committee. So uh, with that, uh, Juan, well, please. Thank you. thank you for a very kind introduction. So can you hear me? Is the, is the mic on? Yeah. Um, so. Um, black holes have been in the news recently. We are really in a golden era for observations about black holes. Uh, my talk will not be about these experimental aspects of black holes, but mostly about uh, theoretical aspects of black holes, quantum mechanical aspects of black holes. In fact, we will uh, discuss some recent progress on the black hole information problem. And uh, we wrote a review, basically it's similar to this talk, uh, with these authors. And this recent progress was uh, spearheaded by some papers uh, by these two groups. And there is another interesting development that is uh, similar in spirit that I will not review, which is a series of papers by Sal Schenker and Stanford. Okay, so the outline is, uh, first I'm going to review some aspects of black hole entropy, the, the fact that ent black holes have an entropy proportional to the area of the horizon. Then um, we'll discuss a new formula for black hole entropy, which is the fine-grained gravitational entropy formula. And it's a similar formula in the sense that it gives the entropy in terms of an area, except that it's a different area. It's some kind of minimal area. Um, then uh, we'll discuss this. We'll apply these formulas to compute the entropy of Hawking radiation coming out of black holes. And uh, we'll get a result consistent with information conservation as opposed to information loss. Now, this talk will not be historical, but hopefully will be pedagogical. But before I start the talk, I, I had a friend. I'm going to tell you a story that I had a friend from, uh, from graduate school who works in condensed matter. And I met him recently, and he told me, I, I don't really get this black hole information stuff. I mean, wh what is it useful for? I talked to my condensed matter uh, friends, and they also don't understand why people are talking about this. Um, it isn't just a black hole, like a piece of coal that you know, emits uh, thermal radiation and, uh, and so on. And I think, I think I should say a few words, perhaps, to try to explain to those of you who well, are probably not in the field to, to, to say why we care about this type of problem. Um, I mean, our goal is uh, to understand quantum gravity. And the most interesting question about quantum gravity is how the universe began. So we need quantum gravity to understand the very very initial instance of our universe. That's the biggest problem in our field. But it's a very hard problem. And um, a simpler problem involves uh, black holes. So black holes also have a singularity in their interior, um, which is somewhat similar to the cosmological singularity. It's a bit like a big crunch singularity in the interior of black holes. And we think that if we understand well enough that singularity, we'll be able to understand uh, perhaps cosmology. 
Now, that's, that singularity is in the black hole interior. And again, the interior is somewhat confusing. So we simplify a little more, and we think we start, we look at black holes at least seen from the outside. And um, even when you think about black holes from the outside, that's a, a simpler problem in the sense that at least you can be far away from the black hole. There are well-defined observables. You can set up very complex observations. And even then, there are questions. So, and the, the one of one famous question is that uh, it looks like the evolution of formation and evaporation of a black hole would be non-unitary. That was an old argument that uh, Hawking gave. And what this recent progress have, sh have shown is that there is a way to uh, understand a little bit more in a more clear way what, what was the problem with Hawking's argument and how to fix it and how to calculate properly what he was talking about. Um, so that uh, this whole so, so that the black hole, as seen from the outside, is more like a, an ordinary system. So that's basically what I tried to review. So hopefully that was a bit more motivation. Um, and uh, so let me uh, go to the to the black hole. Um, the story really starts uh, with this metric. This is a solution of Einstein's equations, it's, uh, written uh, just very soon after Einstein wrote uh, his papers on general relativity. Um, and uh, the, um, the most important, so well, let me say one more thing about the classical black holes. Um, of course, there, there is black holes have a long history. People were confused by the fact that this metric, uh, well, the G00 vanishes at uh, some position that we now call the horizon. It took uh, many years to understand classical black holes, about uh, 50 years since uh, Schwarzschild had his geometry till uh, we had a complete understanding of the uh, of this solution in terms of its Kruskal diagram. Um, now, the most important result about quantum black holes is uh, that uh, black holes have a temperature, uh, which is uh, given in terms of their size by this formula. And this is a very surprising result. And it's, it's surprising because it, they even it even says that black holes can be white. Okay, So if a black hole is hot enough, so if you have a black hole that is small enough, uh, the temp as you make it smaller, the temperature becomes larger and larger. And if the temperature is equal to, let's say, the, the temperature at the surface of the sun, uh, then you would see this black hole as uh, being white. Um, and that would be a black hole whose size uh, is, uh, is such. So the, the wavelength of the radiation coming from a black hole of size r is of the order of the radius. So that uh, tells you that that's what this formula is saying. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, this is, these are quantum aspects of black holes. So it's uh, th thinking about black holes and including the quantum mechanical effects. And so in the simplest approximation, which is this um, approximation in which Hawking derived this result, uh, you think of the black hole as a classical geometry. Um, and you have quantum fields propagating there. And already in this simplest approximation, you find this surprising result uh, that uh, you, you see Hawking radiation. Um, OK. Um, now. OK, so um, there is a simple, simple and quick derivation of this uh, result, which is the following. So you, you first uh, f forget about black holes for a second and think about the partition function for quantum systems. So imagine you have a quantum system with some Hamiltonian, and you take Tracy to the minus beta h. Uh, that computes the thermal partition function. And the idea is that you can think of this uh, thermal partition function as having evolution in Euclidean time. So instead of evolving the system in Lorentzian, Lorentzian time, you evolve it in Euclidean time. Uh, so if you have Lorentzian evolution, you have e to the i t h here. Um, uh, but now we have only beta, so it's evolution over uh, a period of Euclidean time of order beta. And the fact that we have a trace uh, tells us that we're identifying the beginning with the end. And that's uh, essentially saying that we are on a circle. So we have Euclidean time evolution on a circle. So the idea is that then a theory in a Euclidean circle is related to a system in thermal equilibrium. So the temperature um, is equal to 1 over beta, or the length of, of this Euclidean time. Now, we can go back to the metric that uh, Schwarzschild wrote, which was uh, this metric in the first line. 
and make them Euclidean. So if we make them Euclidean, now uh, we have this metric, so it looks very similar to the previous one. But now when we are in Euclidean time, uh, we find that this, this size, well, it continues to become zero at when r, r is equal to rs. But it turns out that if you pick the period of this time appropriately, uh, then uh, the geometry at the center at, at r equal to rh looks basically like the geometry of the plane in polar coordinates, where time is essentially the angle. Um, and so the full geometry is completely non-singular. And then we interpret this geometry. So far away, we can interpret this geometry as computing uh, the thermal partition function of the quantum fields uh, in flat space. And the idea is that this non-singular geometry is described in a black hole, which is in thermal equilibrium which with that gas of particles that is far away at some temperature. So that's a way to compute the formula for uh, the entropy for the temperature, and this is the same formula that we saw before. It was not the Hawking uh, computed in a slightly more physically uh, physical way, but a slightly more mathematically complicated way. Um, now, once you have the formula for the entropy, then for the temperature, you can uh, derive a formula for the entropy by using the imposing the first law of thermodynamics. So um, that that is this equation. And when you do that, then you find the formula, which is equal to the area of the horizon in Planck units. Um, OK, so that's the Hawking-Bekenstein formula. And so one, one of the things that was learned in the 70s when all these things were done was that we can view then a black hole as a thermodynamic object. And this is, this is somewhat surprising. Um, uh, so let's discuss in more detail the geometry of a black hole. Um, so, okay. So here is the geometry of a black hole that collapses. Uh, this geometry was uh, derived by Oppenheimer and Schneider in the 1930s. And so we have a star that collapses into a black hole. Uh, this type of diagrams, uh, we call them Penrose diagrams. So what they are is you take... Uh, you first take the metric, and it's a four-dimensional space. You, we are going to assume that we have spherical symmetry. And then each point on this, uh, on this diagram represents a two-dimensional sphere. That, uh, and then we take that, that metric, and we rescale it so as to bring the regions that are infinitely far away to a finite location on the diagram. So for example, this uh, region here represents the regions that are infinitely far away, and we rescale them. And we rescale them in such a way that we preserve the angles. In particular, light rays uh, propagate at 45 degrees, so the vertical direction is roughly time, and the horizontal direction is uh, roughly the radial direction. Um, so the s at the center of the star, the radius uh, is zero, and the two sphere shrinks to zero here um, in a completely non-singular way. Um, the two radius of the two sphere also shrinks to zero here, but then the, the curvature becomes very large, and we have a singularity. Um, now, the geometry is such that there are regions, uh, for example, in what we call the interior, that cannot send signals to the outside. So if you send the signal to the going to positive r, that would be a light ray that uh, is going along a 45-degree line here, and it will hit the singularity instead of going all the way to infinity. So um, we call a horizon the, the last ra light ray that can depart, let's say, the center of the star and can, well, doesn't quite make it to infinity, but uh, it doesn't make it to a singularity either. It's a, it's a borderline, the borderline uh, set of light rays. And it separates the region uh, that from which we cannot, send sig we cannot receive signals uh, if we're sitting outside. So it looks, so if we are outside the black hole, it looks like the universe kind of splits into two parts. One one piece that is not accessible to you, and one piece that uh, will be accessible to you, uh, if you if you are sitting outside. Um, now, one interesting property of the horizon is uh, that if, if you consider the set of light rays that uh, is forming the horizon here in the far future, um, they, they are not expanding. They are forming, uh, well, it's like the horizon of the short. They have a constant area. Uh, that's the area of the horizon we discussed before. And then you expand them backwards, you, you continue them backwards. At when they reach to the center of the star, 
uh, they have zero area. So as you go forwards in time, the area uh, increases uh, here while the, the matter is falling in, and then it ceases to increase and reaches this uh, maximal value. And Hawking showed that this is always the case when you have horizons, that the area always increases, at least uh, if the matter is purely classical. Um, so this is an example where we see how the, the area increases. Um, now, the formula for, for entropy that uh, Bekenstein had in mind uh, was a formula that really had two parts. One was the entropy all of, of all matter that was outside the black hole, plus an extra contribution, uh, which was the area of the horizon. Okay? So that's the entropy of the system as seen from the outside. And it can include uh, classical matter that is uh, outside the horizon. Um, but, okay. However, uh, when a black hole emits radiation, it loses energy and its area becomes smaller. So in quantum mechanics, we can, fl we can have fluxes of uh, stress tensor that might be negative, and that's what we have when black holes are evaporating. And so the, ener the energy of the black hole becomes smaller and smaller. And uh, if we think of the entropy as purely given by the area term, uh, the area is becoming smaller, so it looks like the second law is violated. However, we should remember that uh, we have this entropy of matter, and this entropy of matter includes, should include the entropy of Hawking radiation, um, because, and it should include, in principle, the entropy of quantum fields. And once you include this, then uh, it was shown uh, relatively recently by Aaron Wall that the second law is now obeyed. So even including quantum mechanical effects, the second law of black hole uh, thermodynamics is, it will be obeyed. So, this entropy of matter contribution uh, contains uh, a contribution which is sometimes called entanglement entropy. It's due to the fact that the horizon divides the space-time into two parts, and you are looking purely at the outside of the uh, at the outside region. And the vacuum in quantum field theory is uh, highly entangled at short distances. So when you do that, you actually uh, will get an infinite answer um, coming from UV modes, ultraviolet modes, very close to the horizon. Um, but that, uh, that UV diversions can be cancelled by a renormalization of G Newton, and uh, in the end, the whole combination uh, is finite. So this, is a, this whole combination is a nice uh, combination that, as we see um, from Aaron Watt's result, obeys the actual uh, loss of thermodynamics, and we'll be considering this combination in the future. So these uh, results have, have inspired the very influential hypothesis which uh, we can call the central dogma or central assumption in the uh, study of quantum aspects of black holes. Um, here I'm using the word dogma in the sense of uh, hypothesis. And um, it, it's a hypothesis is something that we cannot prove uh, from fundamental, f from the gravity equations. So if we have just purely the semi-classical gravity formulation of black holes, it's not something we can uh, see, or at least we don't know how to see it clearly. Um, but uh, so it's a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is that if you take a black hole as seen from the outside, what that means is that uh, you're going to do experiments on this black hole, uh, sending stuff from the outside, watching how it Hawking evaporates, making perhaps arbitrarily precise measurements, uh, and so on, but always uh, from the outside. So you're, you're not going to go inside. So if we uh, do this experiment just purely from the outside, then the idea is that the black hole can be described uh, by a quantum system, uh, so it's the same as some number of qubits, uh, and the number of qubits you would need is equal, it's of the order of the area of the horizon, so the order of the entropy of the black hole. Um, and then these qubits evolve according to a unitary Hamiltonian. So the hypothesis does, does not tell you what the Hamiltonian is, it just tells you that one such uh, unitary Hamiltonian exists. Okay? Um, so it, there are two non-trivial aspects. One is that this evolution is unitary, and the second is that this number of degrees of freedom we are talking about is finite. So you don't, you are, we are not putting an infinite number of degrees of freedom, or, and so on. Um, okay, very good. Um, now, often in our discussions, we'll uh, say, well, how much of the exterior you need to put? So you, you need to separate somehow the black hole Sometimes it's convenient to separate the black hole from the rest of the universe, at least in our discussions. So we're imagining that there will be, let's say we have the black hole, 
and we mash in some surface, and everything that is within this surface we are going to replace by a quantum system, and everything that is outside that surface we leave it as ordinary, you know, flat space uh, physics and so on, which is the region where we're going to do our experiment. So we will neglect gravity outside the surface, um, and then we'll include all the effects of gravity inside the surface. Um, um, so, in particular, for example, when we do uh, black hole thermodynamics, um, we, we are imagining that uh, this uh, trace, so this, this quantity, um, so th this geometry, sorry, this Euclidean geometry has a particular action, so a particular gravity action, and the idea is that this gravity action is giving us an approximation to, the, uh, to this trace, where this trace is not something that is defining gravity, this is a trace that would be defined in the quantum system that the, the gravity theory should be equivalent to. Um, so th this shows that we, we are trying to understand how uh, quantum mechanics and gravity mesh together, and in the idea is that in a full theory of quantum gravity, this hypothesis should be true, and there should be some set of quantum systems, uh, quantum states that describe the black hole. We take the trace over them with that Hamiltonian that we don't know, and the answer uh, should be given by this gravitational action. Um, so notice that this computation tells us um, the answer for the entropy or the free energy, but it does not tell us uh, w what are the explicit microstates we are summing over. So it's not done by first finding the microstates and then summing, but uh, gravity is a bit like an oracle that gives us uh, the final answer. Now, what's the evidence for this hypothesis? Um, well, first, uh, in some theories of quantum gravity, such as string theory, uh, there are special backgrounds with supersymmetry that can be counted, uh, where the black holes can be counted precisely in terms of open strings and difference, and they reproduce the area formula. So in those, in those, those theories, we can find an explicit uh, description of these microstates and reproduce the formula by counting them all in the standard statistical mechanics way. Um, the other, the other uh, evidence is uh, the ADS-CFT. So in that case, you can, you can view ADS-CFT as a more refined version of that, uh, of that hypothesis, where um, you conjecture not only that the black hole is dual to a quantum system, but that the whole universe, a whole universe with negative curvature, is dual to a quantum system that lives on the boundary. Um, and uh, so it's a case where that imaginary surface that is surrounding the black hole, you take it all the way to infinity and you replace the whole interior by um, a quantum system. And in that, that case, the black hole is described by a fluid, some strongly interacting fluid of particles uh, that lives at the boundary. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we, we have a hypothesis for the Hamiltonian. It's the Hamiltonian of the boundary uh, conformal field theory. So we, we have more concrete description of the system. However, uh, there was also an argument against. So this, now we are going to see Hawking's argument against this uh, hypothesis. And Hawking's argument comes from uh, looking at the geometry of the evaporating black hole a little more closely and understanding where, uh, how the, end, the Hawking radiation arises. So this is again the Penrose diagram uh, of a collapsing black hole, but now uh, we've uh, drawn a hypothetical Penrose diagram for the case of an evaporating black hole. So we're imagining that uh, we have Hawking pairs, for example, the red pair here uh, are emitted, so one member of the pair goes all the way to infinity, and the other member of the pair uh, goes to the singularity. What these pairs are trying to highlight, they are trying to highlight the fact that uh, we started here uh, with quantum field theory in a pure state, and um, these pairs are forming a pure state also, and one of the particles goes to infinity, the other one goes to the interior. If we observe only the particle that goes to infinity, we'll have a non-zero entropy, okay? We'll have none. And so we repeat this uh, process for uh, a, a very large number of times. The black hole mass will be slowly decreasing. At some point, the black hole mass uh, becomes a further the Planck scale, and at that point, uh, we cannot trust the gravity equations anymore. Um, but we make the hypothesis that the black hole there uh, quickly, um, qu quickly disappears. Well, th th this rest uh, remnant uh, evaporates quickly, and then we would get this Penrose diagram. So if we do that, then uh, after the black hole completely disappears, the person who is outside the universe, uh, outside, well, which is in this uh, asymptotically flat space region, um, will, um, 
will find the thermal state. And the state will be uh, mixed, no matter how precise that Hawking argued that, that the state will be mixed, no matter how precise your observations will be, because um, the, this, these particles are entangled with particles which were in the interior of the black hole, and these are not causally, causally accessible to you. They are in a second uh, part of the universe which you cannot access. So, uh, I mean, the picture, um, the picture is roughly the following, that uh, the parent, so you have the parent universe that produced the black hole and the Hawking radiation, and that gave birth to a new universe, which is the interior of the black hole, which is completely uh, separated. In, in the, at daytime, so it will be completely separated from the original universe. Um, so, yeah, so we can call this a teenage universe, so it's a big baby universe. So, so these processes are sometimes, when the universe is small, they're called baby universes. And in this case, the universe is big. It's a whole black hole interior. So it's a, more like a teenage universe. Uh, yes? Yes, yes, I'm saying that this, these two pictures, I'm claiming these two pictures are morally equivalent. So if you if you look at if you have information both up in the outside and the baby universe, then information is preserved. Similarly here, that if you have information both in the outside and in the interior, then we are just in a pure state. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Here I'm not making any claim. Here there is again there is a baby universe and it collapses into singularity. It's like a big crunch. Uh, that this universe disappears in a brick crunch, and from the point of view of the outside, we just lost uh, that information. That, that was Hawking's argument. This is that argument. Um, and so the state is pure if you include, well, this already said. Um, now, there is, a, there is a better statement of this problem uh, that is uh, due to Don Page. Um, and this uh, starts first by uh, looking at the following question. So imagine that we have a black hole that we form from a pure state or a very low entropy state. Then, as the black hole evaporates, we start collecting the Hawking radiation. And that the entropy of that Hawking radiation uh, will start increasing as we collect more and more uh, Hawking particles. And it will increase monotonically until the black hole evaporates completely. On the other hand, the area of the black hole horizon will uh, decrease monotonically. That's uh, the orange curve. Uh, as the black hole evaporates. It doesn't have to be a straight line, but it's uh, indicative. Now, what, um, what Page discussed is that um, if this evaporation is unitary, then, um, OK, yeah, just one more thing we could say. Uh, so when we're in the times before this uh, so-called Page time, uh, the entropy of Hawking radiation is less than the uh, number of qubits that are described in the black hole. So we can think of this entropy as arising from entanglement between the, uh, the degrees of freedom of the photons and the degrees of freedom that make up the black hole. However, here, uh, when we are on the, on the, in the period after the page time, the page time is defined when these two lines cross. Um, when we are beyond that, the, uh, the, number, the area or the entropy of the remaining black hole, which is the number of degrees of freedom left in that black hole, is smaller than the entropy of Hawking radiation. So it cannot be that the Hawking radiation is uh, purified or is forming a pure state together with the black hole. So what, Hopi, what Page emphasizes is that the problem with this uh, central dogma, that assumption that we were, we were making, is not present. It's not a problem that was present uh, after the black hole evaporates, but is present even during the evaporation of the black hole. And the advantage of uh, this Page presentation is that you have a problem that arises when the black hole is still big. So the black, this, could be the black, this black hole at this time could still be pretty big. It's smaller than the black hole that started, that started evaporating, but it might be uh, still big, and it's still in a regime where we can uh, trust the semi-classical uh, description. So we would like to find uh, some reason why the entropy follows the, um, the purple curve as opposed to the green curve. Um, now, this problem involves an understanding of the fine grain entropy. So when we're calculating these entropies, we're imagining calculating the actual uh, you know, entropy that we have if we do infinitely precise measurements. 
And this is called the fine grain entropy, sometimes von Neumann entropy. And so let me uh, discuss these two notions of entropy. Um, so the, the fine grain entropy is defined uh, through this formula, also called as I said, von Neumann entropy. It's also called quantum entropy or entanglement entropy, depending on the context. Um, so you have a density matrix rho that describes the system, and then you calculate the trace of rho log rho. So that's uh, the definition. And it's important to contrast uh, this, that description from uh, the so-called coarse grain entropy, or sometimes called Boltzmann entropy. So this is the, the entropy that appears in the thermodynamic laws, and uh, it obeys the second law in particular. The, 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 the first entropy is uh, invariant under unitary evolutions. This one uh, can, can increase. And so this entropy has a slightly different definition that depends on uh, which subset of observables you are tracking. Uh, so you're, you're uh, and we will not need this uh, the precise definition here. The one that will be important for us is this one. So it's important, but it's important to understand the difference between the two. And in order to, to understand the difference, let's uh, just look at one particular example where we see the two kinds of entropy in action. So imagine you have a big box and you have a little box and you have some gas inside the little box, okay? So uh, this gas is it's in a completely, let's say, thermal state in this uh, little box. It will have some entropy, uh, which is given by this formula, the initial density matrix. Now we open the box, and that's a unitary process. The gas sort of comes out and fills the big box. Okay? So the final density matrix is given by a unitary transformation uh, acting on the initial density matrix. And so the final fine grain entropy is uh, going to be uh, given by this formula, okay? And here we can take the u outside and outside these logs and the cyclic property of the trace implies that this is equal to the initial entropy. So that's the statement that the von Neumann entropy is invariant under unitary transformations. So if I get entropy is exactly the same as the initial entropy. Um, on the other hand, the, this is an, in, in thermodynamics, we normally say this is an irreversible process uh, that increases the entropy, because for a gas, the entropy is proportional to the volume, so we'll make the volume bigger, we'll have a bigger entropy. So the, the thermodynamic entropy defined uh, a la Boltzmann uh, will increase and will be bigger than the initial one. Um, okay, I hope uh, this distinction is clear. It will be important for further discussions. Now, usually, maybe when you took your thermodynamics courses, the one you might have also seen this formula for the uh, entropy that appears in the laws of thermodynamics. And that's because the two entropies are equal when you are in thermal equilibrium and you've uh, equilibrated the system, you let it interact with the reservoir for a long time, then the, these two entropies are the same and there is no distinction. But for systems that are evolving rapidly and so on, as we will be discussing, uh, the two entropies are different and it's important for us to uh, distinguish between the two. Okay. Now, for the moment, uh, we'll be talking about the entropy of the black hole as seen from the outside. So when we calculate an entropy, we're going to look at this black hole and calculate its entropy as seen from the outside. And this is the entropy of the quantum system that was appearing in our central hypothesis, right? Uh, so uh, that's what we are going to be calculating in the next few slides. Now, one first observation is that the horizon area if it is computing one of these two entropies, it's computing the thermodynamic entropy, because we saw that it obeys the second law and can uh, increase under a simple evolution, such as a coll collapse of a star. So one question we can ask is, how, how do we compute the fine grain entropy, this von Neumann entropy? Now, it, it, was, um, it, it was thought that the, uh, sorry, maybe I'll go back. Now, naively, naively uh, you, you would uh, think that computing the fine grain entropy should be very difficult because it, in, it involves very precise knowledge of uh, your system. But the interesting thing that was discovered was that there is a sim relatively simple formula for uh, the fine grain entropy, which is a generalization of the Bekenstein formula. Um, so this formula, one version of this formula was first derived by Ruyan Takayanagi and it was improved to uh, this form by some other authors. So the, the formula says that you consider uh, a quantity similar to the one that was appearing in the entropy of black holes. That is, uh, we, we first uh, imagine some surface area X 
So here it's a point, but remember that each point here is a two-dimensional sphere, so we have the area of that sphere uh, that sits at some point. P pick an arbitrary point on this diagram, there is an area. And then we consider a, a surface that uh, comes out of this point and goes all the way to this. Uh, this was some kind of cutoff surface where we big sur big uh, sphere around the black hole, which uh, uh, we are considering the entropy that is inside this big sphere. Okay. Um, so the green line is uh, co-dimension one, surf uh, co -dimension one surface, so three spatial dimensions going from the time t uh, up to this surface x. Um, and then uh, we calculate the area of x and the entropy uh, on this green slice, that's the second term. Um, and depending on where we choose this point x, we'll get different answers, right? So we'll, we'll get different answers for this quantity. And then we extremize over the surface, so we pick uh, the ones such that the first variations in the vertical, the time direction and the space direction vanish, so the first derivatives vanish. Uh, so the first derivatives with respect to the position of the surface vanish. And that gives us uh, some uh, candidate entropy. And it can be, and we will see that it will happen, that there might be two such surfaces, two surfaces that minimize or extremize this quantity. And um, then we need to minimize over the choices of such surfaces. So that's the final answer. Okay. So roughly speaking, we need to uh, minimize uh, this quantity. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's that's his space like surface. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we'll di we'll discuss that in detail. So so for for, for the time being. Uh, so it will, th we, there will be some process of minimization uh, of this kind, and we'll discuss the evaporating black hole in a second. Yeah. 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 That's right. So na naively, if, if we are, if we if we have the quantum system discussion, uh, so we for a general quantum system, you would need the density matrix, the fine grained density matrix. When we are doing, when we're using the semi-classical gravity description, we can get that entropy by looking at the space-time geometry and following this minimization procedure. Uh, that will involve the fine-grained entropy of the uh, of the quantum fields on that geometry, on the, the green slice. That, that's the fine-grained entropy, but not of the microstates that make the black hole. Those are are, are not present in this discussion. Um, okay. Um, OK, so that's, that's the, we'll discuss a little bit how you derive this uh, later. But for the, for the time being, we will just use this formula and, and see what we can learn from it. Just we'll see some examples to see how this formula works. Um, now, as, as your question was uh, reminding us, the, um, we are, it's surprising that we have a simple formula for fine grain entropy. Um, so let's see some examples. Um, so this is the Penrose diagram of uh, the full Schwarzschild solution. So sh full Schwarzschild solution corresponds to, cor well, can be interpreted as two entangled uh, black holes or as a wormhole that joins two exteriors. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that joins two exteriors. So in that case, let's look at the right black hole. And so we have this, we surround it by some surface. We calculate the, the entropy. And in that case, the minimal uh, area uh, is, is at the horizon. And so it sits at this point, and that um, can compute for us the, um, the, the, the fine grain entropy. And in this case, in this particular case, the fine grain entropy is equal to the uh, thermodynamic entropy, or is equal to the, the Hawking Bekenstein entropy. And this is because you can think of uh, the right side as a black hole in thermal equilibrium, okay? that it has a thermal density matrix. Now con let's consider another situation. So let's consider a collapsing black hole. And let's compute the entropy just right after the collapse. So let's uh, so the black hole has not evaporated for a long time, so it just uh, collapsed. And then at this time, um, we can it, it can happen that the surface, the minimal area surface, has zero area. So in this case, we can take this area all the way to the black hole interior, and there it can shrink to zero at the origin. And so we get uh, something with zero area. And the entropy on this slice will be uh, essentially will catch the entropy of the star, 
So we'll have basically the entropy of the star. So here we see that um, before the black hole collapses, we had the entropy of the star. After the black hole, soon after the black hole collapses, uh, we continue to have the entropy of the star as the fine grain entropy. So you see in this example how uh, unitary evolution uh, preserves the fine grain entropy. Okay. Um, very good. Um, so this, this example is somewhat similar to the example of the box, the gas in a box that we saw before. Uh, so this process of opening the box is similar to the process of collapse in the sense that it, it, it gives rise to a large uh, thermodynamic entropy, which is the area of the horizon, but the fine grain entropy remains, uh, remains small. Okay, so now, um, now let's go to the case of a, an evaporating black hole. So, um, so it turns out, and this was the discovery of these papers, that uh, there is a new kind of uh, extremal surface that arises when you have an evaporating black hole. And um, this is a surface that, uh, so let, let's say the black hole has evaporated for a long time, then um, we, we have um, a surface near the horizon of the black hole. Um, remember that the, the, just to try to explain why uh, there is there an extremal surface, we are supposed to extremize with respect to the area plus some entanglement contribution, some entropy contribution of fields. Um, now, the area term has a 1 over G Newton, so it's naively bigger than the other. Um, however, um, you can find an extremal surface because the area is not varying very much when you are close to the horizon. So the area, um, especially if you are in the near the bifurcation surface of a black hole, is not changing. The first derivative vanishes, so you can have a small first derivative by just moving a little bit uh, away from the horizon. And the derivative of the other of the of the fields can be non-zero if you have this uh, evaporating situation. So you can find a new uh, extremal surface. And the important point is that this extremal surface will be relatively close to the horizon, and will have an area which is close to the area of the horizon. Um, okay. So so now um, we'll have we have this situation where uh, we have the evaporating black hole. And at every time, we have two candidate uh, surfaces. So um, especially at these late times, we have the surface that uh, has zero area. Um, and uh, the entropy of this surface uh, is going to start rising. So when we, when we start here is the entropy of the star. Let's say that was zero. And then as you have uh, Hawking particles that are leaving the system, then you have the entropy of the partners. So for example, in this case, this left the system. And when you calculate the entropy here, you'll have the entropy of this uh, Hawking partner, OK? And, and so on and so forth. So we'll have this uh, rising entropy for uh, the entropy of the, the, the black hole, as computed uh, from this surface. Um, soon after the black hole evaporates, we'll have also the second surface. And we'll have um, the, the, the entropy of this one will be track very much the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole will be a curve that will go down. And then uh, the idea is that we are supposed to take uh, the minimum of the two. So at early times, uh, this one will be smaller. So we'll have the green line. And at late times, uh, the other one will be smaller. So we have uh, the orange curve. And so we have a curve similar to, uh, the, uh, to the page curve, but now for the black hole. So this is always where computing the entropy of the black hole. We'll discuss the radiation in a second. I think I might have answered the question you had, but if you still have it, you please ask, ask again. Yeah. Well, I, I, I haven't gotten to that yet. That, that one, that's when we calculate the entropy of radiation. But here, um, here I'm imagining that T3, so T3 is not when the black hole completely evaporated. The black hole is still, uh, you know, has a semi, all these calculations are done in the regime where semi-classical physics is ap applicable. So we are imagining we have some surface that is outside the black hole, right? that has fixed area as we, the black hole evolves. We, we pick it so that it has fixed area. Uh, if you want a very concrete example, you can think of uh, 
a black hole that is in ADS space, and you couple the ADS to some external system. Uh, that gives a very controlled example. But the, the point is that uh, the surface at which, at which we computed, um, where, where we are sitting, is always big, never, never very small. And um, the extremal surfaces we are talking about are always in a region where the, where the semi-classical gravity is applicable. So we are. Yes. Um, well, uh, le le let me let me try to answer that question later. B by by now we are all we are doing now is computing something. Okay, le let me perhaps clarify a little better what we are doing. Um, so we have some geometric object that is this area and so on, that minimizing the area, that we are we are calling an entropy. I think perhaps. The tenor of your question is, why are you calling this an entropy? So it's just some geometric construction. Here, what I'm doing, what I'm showing to you is the, uh, the answer according to this prescription, to that geometric construction. So that's, uh, now you, you, you're very welcome to question why that is the, why that should be an entropy, why. Um, so one, um, one comment that I will make is that uh, th this formula, uh, well, was was proposed, and then um, people checked that they they had all many properties of you expect of quantum entropy. So it obeyed non-trivial inequalities such as the subadditivity of quantum entropy, the fact that it's invariant under unitary transformations, uh, um, some nesting properties. If you consider a bigger system, the, these surfaces are inside. So, so a bunch of properties that you expect from entropy, but you're still welcome to question. It's not. It's not obvious it's an entropy in the usual sense as taking the trace of the states. It's similar, to the, it's similar in, in its status to the black hole entropy, to, to the standard hawking bekenstein entropy. You can also wonder why are you calling this an entropy, you know? So if, if, you, if, you, are, if you are happy calling the, the area of the horizon an entropy, then you should be equally happy calling this guy an entropy. If you're, you're, you're not happy with any of the two, or? Uh, okay. Well, I, 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 I think the last statement is, OK. Um, anyway, so, so I, I think they, the two have a similar status in the sense that they are, they are given by some geometric construction and are not given by uh, some inverse some microstates. And both obey many of the properties you expect entropy to obey. Um, yeah, Herman. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, the attitude from the point of view of doing these computations, I ignore these large boosts. So, it, yeah, so people have discussed uh, whether what we should or should not consider gravity when we have such large boosts. Um, and that that was, yeah, so we, I if we trust these large boosts, we don't run into an obvious problem. Um, let me see. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, semi-classical semi fit. So you, 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 these are all nice. So what, what they are called nice slices. Yes. Well, they, they, they are nice in the sense that you can go from you, you can calculate from here to here what the state of quantum fields are and so on, and you can do the computation. Well, you, you only have collisions if you have if you propagate backward some field to the past and so on. Uh, but but, but that we are not doing that. So we, we are simply tr taking the state of some time earlier time and evolving it to the future. And if you do just that operation, you don't encounter any problem. Though this is this is similar to the question people ask when you when Hawk, when you do the calculation of uh, of Hawking, Hawking radiation, right? So Hawking, when he originally did his calculation, he was considering the fate of two modes: one which was uh, emitted, well, one one 
was a two particles, which were well, two modes that were entangled. And when you do that, uh, and and yeah, or from the future to the past. Yes, yes, but well, you you you, you can take this light ray and, and go to the past. But the point is that if you have a special state in the past, such as the vacuum, then the the stress tensor and everything is non-singular here. And so when you go to the future, there is no you, you can do this computation with essentially no problem. You, you have to assume that uh, if you have a trans mode here, uh, you are making the assumption that when the mode becomes, so if you are coming from the past and um, from the future at some point here, let's say that mode becomes trans -Planckian. You are assuming that that mode goes to the vacuum. If you are going from the past to the future, or if you are going from the, future to the, from the past to the future, um, that mode didn't exist in the semi-classical description. And when it starts appearing, it appears in the vacuum. So we are, we are making uh, that assumption in this semi-classical story. Um, yeah. So if we make that assumption, then that leads to a well-defined calculational procedure to calculate this, this quantities. Um, um, I mean, th th these were things that people, so, OK. I, and it might be that in the end, uh, these slices might not make sense or whatever. Um, uh, but uh, if you assume that they make sense, you don't run into any problem, and you get uh, consistent answers. So let me just say that for the moment, for the time being. Um, I mean, there is a similar issue in cosmology, whether we can do that. And, and the, the answers we get by doing that uh, seem to agree with what we observe. So. Um, OK, so we get the page curve. So here we got something similar to the page curve, but for the black hole. But we wanted, we, what we really wanted was to get the page curve to the, for the radiation. So if we just only look at the radiation, we wanted to get that same curve. And the radiation lives in a region where quantum gravity effects could be very small. So it, it could have left, if, if, we reg if this imaginary surface is the boundary of ADS, it could have left this ADS space, or it could be connect collected by a far away quantum computer where quantum gravity effects are negligible. Um, however, the idea is that since we obtain the state uh, using gravity, and we have a gravity description for, for that state at late times, uh, if we have the full state, we have a gravity description, then um, we should uh, still apply the gravitational fine grain entropy formula for, for, for computing the entropy of that state. Um, so that, that leads to this. Uh, so-called Lyland formula, where uh, you basically say, well, here you have, you are trying to compute the entropy of radiation here far away. Um, and then uh, the idea is that the gravitational prescription should be to uh, calculate, to, to include all possible islands or regions in the gravitating region, uh, which are bounded by some surface X. Um, and will contain these extra spatial slices with it possibly some entropy. So we, uh, we have a formula sim well, which is given by here. Um, we have the area of x and the, the slice that is the blue slice together with this one, so radiation plus this island. And this, we compute this semi classical entropy. And then we try to minimize this. Now, why is it convenient to include this region? Well, it's convenient when we have a situation like a black hole that has evaporated for a long time because we have all the, all the Hawking radiation particles here, and we have all the partners of radiation here. And so by including, uh, by including this region, the entropy of this quantity will be smaller. So it will be smaller than it would have, um, than, than if we considered only the outside. And so when we extremize this, then we uh, get a formula uh, that is similar to what we had before. And, um, and well, one comment here is that uh, the, um, there, there are two, the, the radiation region here, this outside, appears really twice in this formula. And it's important to understand the difference of uh, uh, what is meant by, by the two cases. So um, when we have this full space time, gravity is telling us uh, a quantum state on, that, uh, on this full slice, right? And if we restrict that gravity description to the outside, we get uh, so that some outside state in the semi-classical gravity description. So that's, uh, that's one state, and that appears uh, here when we calculate this entropy. 
On the other hand, we, we also have um, some hypothetical exact state outside, which is what we would get in the full theory of quantum gravity after we sum, let's say, over all topologies, or we treat the quantum theory exactly, not in the semi-classical approximation, but in some exact approximation. Then we'll have some exact uh, uh, density matrix in the radiation region. That's the one that appears outside, and that's whose entropy this formula is supposed to give us. Okay? So this formula is supposed to give us the entropy of the exact radiation state in terms of uh, some, um, in terms of the entropy on the semi-classical of the semi-classical state. So it's given an approximation to the entropy of the radiation state, of the exact, exact, exact radiation density matrix, in terms of a computation that we do purely on the semi-classical geometry. Okay. Um, now, if the initial matter state was pure, the, the quantum extremal surfaces that appear are the same in both cases, and therefore uh, we get uh, we get an entropy for the radiation, which is basically the same, which is identical to the first the curve we got for the black hole, basically for the same reason. Um, so we do we are do we do get here the page curve for the for, for the radiation. Um, so this is a computation uh, of the entropy of Hawking radiation that agrees with the expectation from unitarity, but we have to use this formula, which is this RT formula. It's a gravitational formula for fine grain entropy. Um, now, the skeptic will complain that uh, this is just an accounting trick, right? Um, so, because wh what we are essentially doing when we compute the entropy at late times is that the island would be essentially the full uh, interior and so you're including both the exterior and the interior in the calculation. So you are, you are taking that into account. Um, and the skeptic would always say, well, if you included both the exterior and the interior, of course, you have a pure state. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's what you would say, right? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's, that's reasonable. It's a reasonable thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so it's, a, it's a very reasonable complaint. Um, now, I would say that more than a trick, uh, it's a bit like an oracle. So this prescription for computing the entropy is a prescription that can be derived from the gravitational, from the path integral, from the path integral uh, formulation of semi-classical gravity. I'll discuss the derivation in a second. Um, and I'm saying it's an oracle because it gives us the true Frangen entropy of the exact state by only using the semi-classical state. So it, uh, in that sense, it's a bit like an oracle. It's, it's similar, I think it's conceptually similar to the computation of uh, the black hole entropy computed as the area of the horizon. So it gives us the entropy, but it doesn't tell us what the states are that we are counting and so on. Um, okay. Okay, so now let me let me try to give a derivation for this uh, fine grain entropy formula, and the derivation is conceptually similar to the derivation of the black hole entropy using the Euclidean black hole. So if you think that the Euclidean description is not a good derivation for the black hole entropy, then you're not going to like this derivation. But if you like this derivation, then uh, then you should like this version. So let's go back to the Euclidean one. So again, this is the same picture that we've seen a couple of times. And this picture is purely a geometric computation. We use just this geometry, and we evaluate the action and so on. There are no microstates at any point. And when we say that that's equal to the partition function, here is some interpretation. This is not obvious from gravity. This is just some uh, you know, interpretation of what the calculation we're doing. Um, but w once, once you have this formula, if you interpret it this way, you can say, well, the entropy is given by some derivatives of this partition function, and they give, uh, by the usual reasoning, the area plus the entropy far away. Um, OK, another way of thinking about it is that gravity is somehow holographic, so you can fix the boundary conditions at infinity to be a circle of certain size, Euclidean circle, and then that, that would be the gravitational analog of calculating the trace of e to the minus beta h. So we're fixing the boundary conditions far away and then uh, doing this computation. Um, now, you, you can also uh, imagine cutting open the, uh, this computation and uh, view it as computing the density matrix. So the evolution in Euclidean time is computing a density matrix for states that are somehow defined on a slice roughly like this. Here, there's a problem here at the horizon, so um, this is somehow vague. Um, 
And then uh, you can view this computation as uh, calculating. Uh, you, you go around this, let's say, n times. Then you have trace of rod to the n. And if you take the derivative, so make n continuous, that's the, like changing beta just a little bit. And then this formula uh, would also give the entropy. This is almost identical. This is Well, in this case, it's identical to the previous formula. Uh, but now it becomes non-identical once we uh, realize that we could realize other density matrices by making uh, by doing the same path integral, but uh, changing the boundary conditions of the fields uh, in the Euclidean circle. So if we have this Euclidean circle, we can change the boundary conditions for, for the fields, or we can even include Lorentzian evolution, so in, we, we can have something which contains a little bit of Euclidean evolution, a lot of Lorentzian evolution, and so on. So we can have, but just conceptually, let's think that we have a little wiggle here, a wiggle means that we either change the boundary conditions for some field or, or, or something of this sort. And now what gravity gives us a simple prescription for is to compute traces. So we can compute the trace where we close this circle. Then we don't have to worry about the details of exactly how we define the states on these slice. Uh, and if we compute the trace, uh, then we can compute the trace of Rotilde. So ro I put Rotilde because it's not a normalized density matrix. It has some... Some, norma some arbitrary normalization. And then, uh, now the interesting thing is that if you repeat this uh, evolution three times, uh, for example, or n times, we can then uh, calculate the trace of rho tilde to the, to the thir third power, for example, in this case. And then we can have a geometry that, uh, that is smooth, uh, similar to the black hole geometry, so except it will, not, it will not have the U1 symmetry, will, it will be deformed, will be deformed black hole geometry. Oh, I'm running out of time. So um, now um, then we can analytically continue. So we do this n times. So we put an n here instead of a 3. Uh, we then take the derivative with respect to n at n equal to 1. We analytically continue this, and we get this formula. So this is uh, the best. This is a derivation we have of, this, uh, of why this formula follows. So that's, uh, I don't know if this derivation satisfies uh, you, but this is the derivation we have of, of the fine grain gravitational formula. Um, now, um, so now if the, the state is prepared by a Euclidean path integral, then we can have Lorentzian time evolution and so on. Uh, then um, when we apply this trick, we should allow various topologies in the interior. And then the, when we do this computation n times, uh, these interiors can be connected by topologically non-trivial space-times called replica wormholes, and those uh, give rise to this uh, island formula that we discussed previously. Uh, this is a, a picture of how that happens, a uh, sketch of uh, how that happens. So we have, um, this is, uh, think of, uh, let's say, something like Euclidean time going in this direction. Um, at equal to zero, we are computing the entropy of the outside. Uh, so we're connecting the two copies in the outside. We are not connecting them. Uh, in here, um, and then we have the Euclidean black hole here has been uh, flattened to a disk. Um, and so this is the ge geometry that Hawking would have computed to uh, give Hawking's result. Um, on the other hand, so after we repeat n times and so on, we get Hawking's result. Um, so here, on the other hand, we have the possibility since the interior, since the gravitational part, uh, in the gravitational part, the space time is dynamic, we can have different topologies. And the different topologies can compute can connect the interiors of the different copies that appear in the replica trick. This we can call replica wormholes that connect uh, these various components. And it's uh, those connections that give rise to the island formula because here when we take the n equal to 1 limit, we are finding that we are connecting uh, the interiors and this amounts to including that region in the computation of the entropy, of the entropy of the bulk state. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, so, so we can compute trace of rod to the n tilde uh, by computing using all these non-trivial geometries. But it turns out that when you take the n going to 1 limit, which is the case when we go to the von Neumann entropy, the von Neumann entropy is given by computation in the original geometry. So we don't have to find all these wormholes explicitly. They only appear there to justify the computation. But um, we can then do the computation in the original semi-classical geometry, which is the the formula of Ruben Takayanagi and so on that we've uh, discussed so far. Um, 
Okay, so um, I think I'm out of time, right? What uh, did I start? Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, this is telling us something about the interior, and it's, it's basically telling us the following. So, so we we can have the following question, or maybe I I need really talk about this. Um, so when we say that the degrees of freedom of the black hole are describing the black hole as seen from the outside, you might wonder, well, do they also describe the interior, right? So the non-trivial aspect of black holes is that they have an interior. And so those degrees of freedom, do they describe the interior or not? And there are various possibilities. Do they describe all the interior, none of the interior, or part of the interior? And this is the correct answer. And the answer of which part of the interior they describe is they describe everything that is can be obtained by evolving from the slice that was appearing in the computation of the entropy. So when we calculate the entropy at this time, there is this surface X and so on, and there is this slice. So we look at the um, domain of dependence of this slice, so everything that can be determined from initial conditions there, here. Uh, that is some wedge that's sometimes called the entanglement wedge. And the idea is that the black hole degrees of freedom that describe the black hole from the outside also describe a little portion of the interior, so the little portion of the interior that is there. Um, and so in situations with evaporating black holes, um, so if uh, we had that, if, if we include the whole interior, so there are situations where we can include the whole interior, situations when we have a portion of the interior. And in that, in this case, uh, there is the, 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 the exterior, so these radiation degrees of freedom are also describing this other portion of the interior, okay? So that same prescription. And uh, so that's what we, uh, seem to conclude from here uh, that the interior of the black hole, this portion of the interior, is really described by uh, the degrees of freedom of the radiation. And by describe, what it really means is that if you have a probe qubit here, you can recover it from by doing very complex operation on operations on the radiation. Um, OK. Um, well, let me just conclude. So we reviewed the gravitational fine grain entropy formula, and we applied to a computation of the entropy of Hawking radiation and ob obtain some results consistent with unitarity. And at late times, most of the interior is part of the radiation and not part of the black hole degrees of freedom. Um, now you can wonder what Hawking's mistake was, and I think the mistake was not to use this uh, modern uh, fine grain entropy formula. Uh, of course, it wasn't known at the time. Um, now, a lot of what was discussed here was derived initially by thinking about aspects of ADSCFT, which itself involves string theory. Um, however, to, for the whole discussion we had here, you only need gravity as an effective field theory, both to apply and uh, justify these formulas. And so there is an amazing connection between gravity and quantum mechanics uh, that we can get by only just thinking about uh, gravity as an effective field theory. Um, oh, and let me go back. Uh, now, you can wonder where the information puzzle is solved. And I would say that one aspect, which is to compute the entropy, uh, yes, it's solved. There is an, uh, another aspect, which is understanding what the state is. So we said that we can compute the entropy of Hawking radiation, but one of the questions is, what is that state? I mean, what is actually the microstate or the, that special state that came out of the process? And that we don't know in how to compute it using gravity. Maybe this might answer your question, because I think you were objecting. You, you were, yeah. Is that, does this answer your question or not? Okay. Um, yeah, so this, this is something that uh, we don't know. So recovering the information completely is just really to, uh, to find what this state is. So these formulas for the entropy uh, are uh, an argument that the information, gr gravity somehow knows that the information should be recovered, but it doesn't tell us exactly how, what that information actually is or what the state actually is. Um, Okay, um, yeah, these points are already made. So I guess there are further lessons that probably this is teaching us about the interior of the singularity, and we will also like to understand the implications for cosmology. Okay, thank you. Okay, so as you mentioned, uh, the formula is semi-classical, doesn't really care about the fine grain details of quantum gravity. Um, do, do you have any good rationale for why that should be the case? Or? Um, 
No, I think we are lucky that there is this formula. So in, in fact, uh, when b before people derived this formula, uh, we used to think that, yeah, we, we would need to know gravity very precisely in order to calculate the entropy of this uh, radiation. So the, this business about the page curve was, was known, that we should get this curve. And we thought that it would involve uh, you know, finding first the state very precisely and then computing its entropy. So, so a, a bit we, are, we are lucky that there is this formula that allows us to compute uh, the entropy without knowing the, all the details, the detailed states. Uh, yeah. But. So is that something uh, in light of all this that uh, we could test if we could put n equals 4 on a computer at strong coupling? Could we answer some of these questions and see that it is a freedom, that part uh, is described? Well, what I, could I, we yeah, compute? Yeah, so the... the yeah, if you have n equal to, if you have just purely the boundary description, that's like having the black hole degrees of the black hole as seen from the outside. There, the description is manifestly unitary. Um, so there, the problem would be how to recover the interior, how to recover the the black hole degrees of freedom. What approximation you need to do of this uh, this uh, this theory to recover the interior? Um, now. I, I think uh, one paradigm that I think is co at least conceptually nice is this idea of tensor networks, perhaps, that they are somehow analogous to the interior. And so one would like to develop something analogous to tensor networks that gives us the full information about the geometry, so even more detailed than tensor networks, but uh, that uh, give us... Uh, yeah, so it's some... So there the problem is to recover the interior. Um, so the, the nice feature of these uh, developments is that the, um, the we, we are recovering a feature we see in the unitary description, also from using the gravitational variables. Um, the, the n equal to four super mills will give you more. It will give you what that state is. Uh, so, but uh, but the, the idea is to understand this from both both languages, both from gravity and uh, the boundary theory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, so the, this green diamond. Yeah. What would be the counterpart of these diamonds in the gauge theory? Um, well, in the, the, yeah. So what these diamonds tell you is which region of the space-time the gauge theory describes, right? So imagine you have n equal to four super mills and you have this setup. Um, so at the time t uh, on the left. Uh, that is, in principle, describing everything in the interior. So any, any qubit uh, that is in the green region can be recovered by some operation in that super young mills theory. Uh, on the other hand, if you are at this time, um, if you have a qubit here, you cannot recover it from uh, any operation in the super young mills theory. Um, in some sense, it, it tells us the, we can call it the limitations of ADS-EFT, right? So when we say we, we have ADS-EFT, we are imagining we are in the boundary, and that boundary describes uh, the interior of that space-time. But if there is a horizon, does it describe also the, what is, lies be beyond that horizon? Right? So people, people used to think at some point that, yeah, maybe it, it, it describes everything that is behind the horizon. But what we understand now is, no, it describes only up to the edge of the entanglement wedge. Th that's all, all it describes. Something that lies beyond that might be described by some other theory or some other system. Um, so what people used to say before is that, well, maybe there is some kind of projection or constraints on the types of states that you could have in the interior that would make sure you, could not, could, you couldn't have too many states. What, what we say now is different, is that if you have too many states, okay, they are entangled with some other system. And then they are described or their information can be recovered from the other system. In this case, the blue radiation region. Okay. Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you for the yeah, talk. Sure. It was amazing. Uh, I have this very simple question. Uh, do you see a neat physical reason why the, um, the second quantum extremal surfaces nucleates one scrambling, like after a scrambling time, after a black hole formation? <coughs> black hole formation. Because considering all the other um, context where a scrambling times a happen, you know, appears, it doesn't seem obvious to me why it's the relevant time scale for this phenomenon of, a, of a, the formation of a quantum exterior surface. Um, 
Well, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's relevant for the following reason that, um, r roughly speaking, let me give you a rough reason. So, um, um, this, this, yeah. Um, notice that this degree of freedom that is here, right? On the other side, well, um, well, I think what I'm what I'm trying to explain is that uh, that if, if you project this line um, back back in, in here to the to the boundary, right? Uh, this should be roughly a scrambling time before. Okay, so why why roughly why, why is that? Right, I'm trying to answer. It's related to the answer to this question. The answer to your question is related to this one. Um, and um, it, it, it basically need, needs to be here um, because um, if, you, if you send some information and some earlier information here, right? So that earlier information will be uh, contained here in the, will be contained, um, will be contained in the blue region, right? At this time. If you send something earlier than the scrambling time, it will con be contained in the blue region. If you send something later than the scrambling time, uh, it will not have completely scrambled everywhere. So it will not have some sense di distributed completely in the system. And the evolution might not have taken it out of the system. So the idea is that the, the evolution, it's important here that you are coupling the black hole to the exterior, right? And um, if something is completely scrambled, then some simple process of Hawking radiation could remove that information from your system. Uh, it's sort of like teleportation. Um, it's kind of teleporting that information outside of your system to the radiation. Um, that's, the mac that's the boundary description. From the point of view of the interior, it's just moving this information to the blue region. Right? And in the same way that for teleportation, you need your, um, so, so, you, 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 so in teleportation, you send in something to an entangled system, right, to, to, to some system. Then you need to mix up the degrees of freedom of the thing that is entangled um, uh, with the message. Right? Um, and in this, and scrambling is making sure that your that that mixing is done very thoroughly, so that a simple measurement can transfer the information out. I'm not sure if I answered satisfactorily, but um, <coughs> yeah. Just I don't understand how this uh, page curve way of thinking is sort of reliable in general because if you wait an infinitely long time, a black hole decays, say, in a billion quanta. Yeah. Now, in a belly body quantum system, you know, with billiard balls and everything, most of the negative entropy comes from higher order correlations, yeah. which were formed in the beginning, so during the quantum gravity phase, but are imprinted at the end. Right, right. If you just look at the expectation value of one quantum, then yes, it would look thermal, but if you look at a billion quanta, they might all be entangled. Right. And it might Im be impossible to measure it because it will need an ensemble of systems, so an ensemble of black holes to measure multi-particle correlations. Right. Right. I'm just thinking about you know, billiard balls, which first interact and then, yes, 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 yes. And then go away. Now, in semi-classical sort of engaged gravity correspondence, most of these entanglements, the planar limit just takes them out. They will be suppressed by orders of NC. Yes, yes. So, so it's important that uh, the formation of the black hole is something that happens outside the planar limit. So <laughs> that there are no black holes in the planar limit. But you, uh, it's yeah. just that, like, this page curve kind of says there is a well-defined inside and outside entropy. Yeah. But if you think yeah. of multiparticle correlations, that's not really the case, right? Because yeah. correlations between inside, outside, different parts of inside, different parts of right, outside. Right, right, right. Well, I, I think, okay, let me, your question had different points. So um, I, I guess w one question, so the idea is that the, the geometry um, contains some degrees of freedom, right? And what these formulas are tell you is how these degrees of freedom are encoded in the full, let's say, UV description of quantum gravity. In the full description of quantum gravity, which contains one piece that describes the black hole and some other piece that describes the radiation. Um, and with these formulas, we have a sharp distinction in some degrees of freedom either are in one or some are clearly in the other. The white regions are, are in, you need both uh, information from both of them. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is something that we think is true for some special states, which are some, the ones that we can, that have this simple semi-classical description. 
if you start having uh, maybe superpositions of geometries or there are situations where you don't have this very sharp distinction. I know, so that's part of the question. I think your other part of the question was, um, you know, in ordinary systems, uh, measuring the fine grain entropy is very complicated. And uh, so it's a bit surprising that in these systems it's simple. Now the idea is that, I think the idea is that the, the, the gravitational evolution um, the, does not take us to the most general state in Hilbert space. It just takes us to a special semi-classical state. And it's that semi-classical state that has this, yeah, thanks to the fact that it has the interior, it's special. And because it's special, we can calculate this um, von Neumann entropies. I think that's uh, the best, well, that's an answer I could give you. Uh, All right, so I think the difference between a general system and this is that here we have an interior. So, um, and in order to find this fine grain entropies, you need to know what happens in the interior. So the, if, if you remain outside, all you have is the uh, hawking bekenstein entropy, the coarse grain entropy. And so knowing the interior is similar to knowing the fine grain, some aspects of the fine grain information. All right, so there's a question on the chat. Yeah. Is the method for computing entropy using replica wormholes well-defined in the sitter space? Um, well, the, the, the method in principle is well-defined. The problem is that the problem is not so well-defined in the sitter. So you, you don't know the entropy of what you are computing. So in, in the sense that in this context, um, we fix the asymptotic structure of space so far away in their non-gravitating, so there is uh, some, set, some region in the space times where the effects of gravity are very small. So asymptotic structure is fixed. And there we can say that we have many copies and how we connect the copies and so on. And that's setting up the computation for the entropy. And that we don't, we don't have in uh, the sitter. So, so the sitter observable observer is uh, always subject to quantum fluctuations and uh, I mean, the people have explored how to compute entropy. Of course, we have the formula for the sitter entropy um, that we, but we don't know what the full microscopic interpretation of this is. Is the sitter entropy saying that we have, uh, you know, some quantum mechanical system that um, that we define a number of degrees of freedom that describes this, or is it saying something different? Uh, so it's, it's a proposal that that it does so, but. My question is also related, yeah. but so our whole motivation of studying the studying black holes, like you mentioned in the beginning, information problem is to understand quantum gravity better. And you also mentioned that all this was motivated a lot by a theory of quantum gravity, which, yes, which yes, is ADS CFT. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but do you think, but anywhere, all your diagrams were, had no ADS, they were all flat space diagrams, yeah, all this yeah. prescription works. So, do you, so have we achieved that goal of getting some intuition about quantum gravity, or could you comment on what we have learned for something like DSCFT or flat space quantum gravity? Um, well, we 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 we've learned something about the com how to compute the entropy of Hawking radiation, which is uh, one aspect. Um, I don't think that these ideas have led to something new in cosmology, uh, but maybe someone will find something new in cosmology of how, how to apply this to co compute entropies or some aspects of cosmology. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, what is the analog of page time in CFT in the context of ADS CFT duality? Where is the, what is space time? Uh, what is the ana analog of page time in dual field theory in the context of ADS CFT duality? Of? Page time. Page time. Yes. Yeah, so, so um, I, I, I think that diagram that we discussed can be, can be done for any field theory, any quantum system that is uh, undergoing some evolution and emitting radiation uh, will have an analog of page time. So it's when the entropy of the radiation emitted is equal to the entropy of the remaining object, uh, the, the coarse grain entropy of the remaining object. So that, that, that will define the page time on the boundary. In the case of the merger of black holes, this formula for far entropy still respects the second law of thermodynamics because uh, you have terms no, from no, the... No, the formula for the fine grain entropy has a different law. It says that it's invariant. So you compute it before the merger or after the merger should give you the same answer for the fine grain entropy. The coarse grain entropy, of course, uh, will increase. Yeah. Um, 
so it's also a related question, I guess. But it seems that if you take the this formula for the for the radiation seriously, mm -hmm. that the information sort of gets delocalized in a semi-classical limit, right? That part sort of ends up yes, on yes, the outside yes, yes, and parts yes, on yes, the inside. Yes, in that, in that, yeah. Do we have a good understanding of why this happens? I mean, you mentioned teleportation in some way, but to me, it seems very mysterious that you get this delocalization of information to get yes, a semi-classical yes, yes. geometry. It, it, it looks like there is some kind of non-locality. Yeah, that's I think right. Its full consequences have not been understood. I would say. But does it have something to do with the sort of the smoothness of the geometry that you want the entanglement to be structured in this way? Or um, I mean, is there some intuition for? Um, well, I. I at this level, there is no. I mean, from these formulas, uh, w we are getting this this description, yeah. and um, it's not telling us very clearly, at least within the semi-classical description, how the information will come will come out. Uh, if you're trying to imagine how information, so I think your question is somehow related to how information will come out yep, in yeah, the Lorentzian so. description. Yeah. So typically, what happens in such cases is that um, you you have uh, multiple copies of space of space-time and wormholes that connect them and so on. Um, and we only have very clear descriptions of what happens in Lorentzian signature for some, for some very special cases, okay. like the two-sided black hole, and you send a message, and you collect some hook. So that this discussion of teleportation, for example, um, is a somewhat clear picture of how you can recover the information. But um, I think uh, th so you could imagine that you uh, take the radiation, you start applying complex operations that will start shrinking that uh, yeah. the, the warm, so some kind of quantum wormholes that connect the yeah. two, the, the exterior and the interior. Um, we'll start shrinking them and perhaps give something similar to the two-sided yeah. black hole. That would be one method. Because it seems that the... Let, let, let me, yeah, let me yeah. perhaps uh, try to answer this. Let me make one point that is relevant to this question. Um, when we are talking about recovering the information that is inside, we are talking about doing a very complicated operation, right? And your question, I think, is somewhat related to what is the Lorentzian picture of how that information comes out. It looks non-local yeah. that you can and get like something from here and then suddenly right? it, yeah. uh, it, yeah. it, it, it appears outside. So, so the idea is that when you have a very complex operation, you cannot neglect the space-time that is created by this ah, operation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the operation itself might create a second space-time, and that second space-time can be connected through to this interior via some kind of wormhole. And that, that is uh, roughly how we think, we think information comes out. But I think uh, we don't have a very clear discussion. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so just to understand something, um, in this proof of the island conjecture, uh, these replica wormholes appear because you are like gluing the copies uh, and following this uh, this island su surface or something like that, or why, where's the reason? Yeah, the so idea the idea is that, that the so you, you have the n copies, and we are instructing to calculate trace of rot to the n. That means that the exteriors are glued in some way, right? But the interiors can glue in whatever way they want. So if the interiors are also glued, you have the replica wormholes. And then that's similar to um, in, when, when you take the n equal to 1 limit, that's similar to including the, end, the, the interior as part of the region whose entropy you are computing. Because since, since the interiors are glued, that looks, from the bulk point of view, it looks like you are computing the entropy of both the, the outside region at, together with the interior. That, that's the same computation you would use in the bulk uh, replica trick in the interior. Um, so that's just the idea. Uh, one last question. Yeah. Uh, this is more a follow-up with the previous one. Suppose mm -hmm. I'm an uh, asymptotic observer yeah. collecting radiation. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way to distinguish whether that comes from a black hole or a star, a normal star? Um, um, no, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the question is, when you are in this radiation, can you tell that, uh, yeah, that you had this little blue triangle, uh, well, this that little blue triangular region? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It, the, the question is, I, I think, but let me just elaborate a little bit. So the question is whether this 
this region here makes some kind of more objective sense, right? Uh, or is it so? That one one observation is that this entanglement wedge reconstruction only tells us that we can recover the, the state of a probe qubit that we send there. We can recover it. That, that's that's what it says. But not that we can recover anything because if we put arbitrary, if we start sending changing that in an arbitrary way and entangle it with entangling it with the third system, then we lose our ability to recover it from the from the radiation region. We will recover it from somewhere else. So, so the sense in which uh, the blue region here is contained, it's somewhat inc inc incorrect to say that it's contained there. What, what is correct is to say that if you send a probe qubit, you can recover the information of that probe qubit. Um, so, but yeah, so I think uh, saying that you objectively know what this uh, interior is from the state of radiation, it's a little iffy. So people who, who talk about these ideas of complexity would tell you that the answer is yes, um, because the, you, you try to find the, tens the simplest tensor network that describes this uh, radiation state, and it will have somehow have to have some shape roughly, roughly like that. Um, but yeah, I think this is well, this is not completely clear. Uh, okay, so there, there's <laughs> one more question. <laughs> okay, uh, very non-technical question. I'm trying to get a non-technical answer yeah. to the the point you raised yourself, the skeptical. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, point, good, right? Good, good. So the idea, uh, I'll try to reproduce, I think you gave the answer just trying to reproduce yeah. it, right? So the idea is that you, yes, you're looking for the, in the states inside the black hole, but the reason, inside the horizon, but the reason you can do that is because there's a copy of this information on the outside because of entanglement, right? So that information is also contained in the blue region to the right, and that's why uh, you didn't lose it. Well, th there is a kind of almost pure state that is in the, I mean, the radiation is entangled with the interior, right? Yeah. Yes. So that works like a copy of the information. So it's, it's valid well, to say you didn't lose it. Um, or not. I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, you, you could say that, so the radiation depends on what you, what you call information. If by information you mean the entropy that the radiation contains, yeah, the, the radiation appears in the semi-classical description to contain a very large amount of, of entropy. But once you consider it together with the interior, it contains less. So, okay. Uh, so, sure and, and, and then a follow-up is, uh, could you turn that into a prediction for the spectrum of emission of the black hole? Uh, or is that equivalent no, to knowing the micro No, these are all subtle states? correlations. I mean, the spectrum of emission from a black hole, in principle, is, I mean, just this if by spectrum you mean uh, the spectrum of, let's say, single photons that come out of the black hole, they are, we expect that they are correctly described by the semi-classical description. For example, in the, in the past people said uh, maybe the spectrum coming out of the black hole is discrete because the area is quantized and so on. This are, I, I don't think this is correct according to semi... This is definitely not what you find in semi-classical gravity, and it does not need to happen for these formulas to be correct. All right, so let's thank Juan for a wonderful collection. And let's get back at 10 to 4.